All right, good morning, folks. Thank you all for deciding to spend your morning coffee break with Theodore Roosevelt, Henry Cabot Lodge, and I, and with the Battle of New Orleans, uh, today's episode in the American Hero Tales of Roosevelt and Lodge. And I'm going to preface today's little chat uh, and uh, examination of this chapter uh, with the whole concept of hero tales. The concept of, of hero tales here, and Roosevelt and Lodge uh, mean it, um, is to give you inspiration and, you know, in a sense, to think of these, these acts of heroism and what went into them, what produced it, how the virtues of these heroes may be expressed. Uh, Roosevelt and Lodge want more American young people to uh, grow up knowing who they are, what their nation means, and what the great heroism of the past has been. They, they want young people to Think about, at that moment of crisis, the people who stood out and acted well at other moments of crisis. Great leadership and courage, and particular pieces and aspects of leadership and courage have been examined, and it's going to happen again today with Andrew Jackson and the Battle of New Orleans. Something they didn't bother to say. And if you study the lives of Roosevelt and Lodge, there's no reason they needed to bother to say it. Uh, but it but it would fit with today's conventions to say so. Uh, take Governor Morris, who expressed such great physical courage and moral courage uh, as this basically helpless one-legged man operating on bluff. We studied him several sessions ago. Um, saving refugees from the mob in the French Revolution. And we look at him in those few pages of this chapter in American Hero Tales, and we say, there is a man with virtue in action. That he was a hero for a period of weeks during the French Revolution, does not imply that Governor Morris was a hero throughout his life in every decision he ever made. And so today we are not going to get into the complicated legacy or the criticisms of the decisions uh, or the point of view of Andrew Jackson, although we are going to get into his personality a little bit. The hero tale of the Battle of New Orleans is about a leader and his men on the spot saving the nation. And if you want to know why he loomed so large, even if your object is to, is to go after Andrew Jackson and say everything bad about him, you'd better step back and see why he loomed so large and why he loomed so large uh, and in large part is because of what people knew about this victory at the Battle of New Orleans. So let us return to early 1815. The War of 1812 has just ended on paper. And the most important battle of the War of 1812 is about to be fought. Uh, this time the opening verse they chose is from a poet named Thomas English. The heavy fog of morning still hid the plain from sight when came a thread of scarlet marked faintly in the white. We fired a single cannon, and as its thunders rolled, the mist before us lifted, many a heavy fold. The mist before us lifted, and in their bravery fine came rushing to their ruin the fierce. Shades of our 
previous session on the fight of the Armstrong privateer. In that episode, uh, a group of American sailors and their captains stood off repeated attacks by the superior numbers uh, and the uh, tremendous training and discipline as well of one of the finest fighting forces in the world. Now on land, a small American army is going to face a larger British one and not a, a foolish and cumbersome and reckless army, but an army commanded by a hero of the wars against Napoleon, an army of experienced, disciplined, professional soldiers. And yet, just as with the smaller fights of the Armstrong privateer, a new nation is going to defend itself and maintain its honor. When in 1814, Napoleon was overthrown and forced to retire to Elba, the British troops that had followed Wellington into southern France were left free for use against the Americans. A great expedition was organized to attack and capture New Orleans. And at its head was placed General Pakenham, the brilliant commander of the column that delivered the fatal blow at Salamanca. Oops. Sometimes I need something other than share screen when I intend to share screen. Here we go. And this sets up the situation that is going to come about with the Battle of New Orleans. Pakenham, a fleet of British warriors and transports carrying thousands of victorious veterans, manned by sailors who had grown old in a quarter of a century's triumphant ocean warfare anchored off the broad lagoons of the Mississippi. So this invading armada, this fleet, is not a, a force to scorn anything but. And the popular history of the Battle of New Orleans, because it was such a great American victory, perhaps, uh, and because uh, Johnny Horton was a really fun man, um, you know, we have this merry and cartoonish uh, song. Uh, I, I recommend that any youngsters watching, in fact, uh, look up and, and learn the song of the Battle of New Orleans. Uh, that is its title, and it starts out in 1814. We took a little trip, uh, took a little trip along with Colonel Jackson down the mighty Mississippi, and portrays basically the, the Brits as, as being foolish and the Americans as being triumphant. Understand that the reality of the battle, it was a far more ominous and bitterly fought situation. Uh, and here we have a painting done of the man considered the main protagonist in the affair, uh, General Andrew Jackson. As these enemy forces loom, returning to Roosevelt's narrative, it seemed as if nothing could save the Creole city from foes who had shown in the storming of many a Spanish walled town that they were as ruthless in victory as they were terrible in battle. There were no forts to protect the place. The militia were ill-armed and ill-trained, but the hour found the man. Andrew Jackson's Tennesseans marched into New Orleans. Now, listen to this description of his Tennessee troops. And if you listen to descriptions given from the American Revolution by Roosevelt and Lodge, you'll, you'll see they're hitting one of their favorite themes again. And just imagine these guys marching into New Orleans, clad in hunting shirts of buckskin or homespun wearing wolf skin and coon skin caps and carrying their long rifles on the shoulders, the wild soldiery of the backwoods tramped into the little French town. They were tall men with sinewy frames and piercing eyes. Under old Hickory's lead, they had won the bloody Battle of the Horseshoe Bend against the Creeks 
They had driven the Spaniards from Pensacola, and now they were eager to pit themselves against the most renowned troops of all Europe. Were all of them tall? I, we, we're given a picture here of, of thousands of John Wayne walking into town. Once more, our story stars as it did in some of the American Revolution stories, or at least as supporting characters, the hunting shirt, uh, that common frontier substitute for a uniform, and the Kentucky rifle, the long rifle, which was so accurate and which was handicapped in battle by not being fitted for bayonets, and that'll come up later. But again, this is a story of the frontier Americans, of the men who grew up in the tough circumstances, meeting the challenges of the frontier. And I don't know if they marched into town eager to fight these British troops. Probably if the Brits had decided to sail away instead, Many in the ranks might have not said, oh no, I really wanted to get to fight them. But Jackson is eager and zealous, and they are certainly willing to meet this overwhelming threat. And that's probably a very accurate description of how they looked carrying their long rifles on their shoulders, the wild soldiery of the backwoods. Roosevelt adds, Jackson acted with his usual fiery, hasty decision. It was absolutely necessary to get time in which to throw up some kind of breastworks or defenses for the city. It resolved on a night attack against the British. Now this night attack that he launches against Pakenham's troops uh, is not what we think of as, quote, the Battle of New Orleans. But it has to happen if the Battle of New Orleans is to be set up in a way that the Americans can defend, uh, an immediate attack on the British, who think that they're the ones on the offensive, uh, it throws them off balance that night, it buys a little time while they reorganize, and now the Americans have a chance, the Americans and the French of New Orleans, the French Americans of New Orleans, have time to put their city's defenses in a little bit more order. Skipping ahead, the British had been so roughly handled, they were unable to advance for three or four days until the entire army came up. Back in them being a little cautious there. When they did advance, it was only to find that Jackson had made good use of the time he had gained by his daring assault. He had thrown up breastworks of mud and logs from the swamp to the river. First, the British tried to batter down these breastworks with their cannon, but they had many more guns than the Americans. A terrible artillery duel followed. For an hour or two, the result seemed in doubt, but the American gunners showed themselves to be far more skillful than their antagonists. Gradually getting the upper hand, they finally silenced every piece of British artillery. Popping ahead here a bit. Um, be aware this is a National Park Service map if you need better contacts to get a good look at it. Uh, I'm putting a note here because when I put it into the show, it cut off the announcement on the bottom and I, I wanted to give due credit. It's also a good place for you to look um, to understand this battle better if you want to hunt this up. Um, but looking at the set up of the battle here. You can see it's not a particularly complex battle. It's largely a straight line force on force attack bounded by the Cypress Swamp on the British right and the Mississippi River on the British left. The defenses there, and I think I've got a painting here, the men they call the cotton balers. Uh, these American soldiers are sheltering behind bales of cotton. And you see the British approaching in the distance uh, and one of those effective gunners in the foreground. But the cotton balers are along that American defensive line. 
The Americans had used cotton bales in the embrasures, and the British, hogsheads of sugar. Uh, valuable stuff to be using to stop, try to stop bullets. Uh, and that would be back with the British guns. Neither worked well. The cotton caught fire, and the sugar hogsheads were ripped and splintered by the round shot, so that both were abandoned. By the use of red-hot shot, the British succeeded in setting on fire the American schooner, which had caused them such annoyance on the evening of the night attack. And if you look on the river, you can see that Jackson is using some uh, naval assets that have been thrown together uh, to support his forces, to shoot towards the British from the flank. Having failed in his effort to batter down the American breastworks, and the British artillery having been fairly worsted by the Americans, Pakenham decided to try open assault. He had 10,000 regular troops, while Jackson had under him but little over 5,000 men who were trained only as he himself trained them in his Indian campaigns. Not a fourth of them carried bayonets. Uh, pause here for a still significant point here in January of 1815. The battles that the British were used to fighting in Europe, and they were masters of their craft. Uh, they exchanged volleys with their smooth form muskets with the French, but the real decision making would come with the bayonet charges. And they are ferocious, close range fighters, and the lack of bayonets on American weapons um, is a decided disadvantage. With such troops to follow him, that is Pakenham, and such victories behind him in the past, it did not seem possible to Pakenham that the assault of the terrible British infantry could be successfully met by rough backwoods riflemen fighting under a general as wild and untrained as themselves. Long before dawn, the riflemen and that refers to the Americans, were awake and drawn up behind the mud walls where they lolled at ease or leaning on their long rifles, peered out through the fog toward the camp of their foes. At last, the sun rose and the fog lifted, showing the scarlet array of the splendid British army. As soon as the air was clear, Pakenham gave the word and the heavy columns of red-coated grenadiers and kilted highlanders moved steadily forward. From the American breastworks, the great guns opened, but not a rifle cracked. Three-fourths of the distance was covered, and the eager soldiers broke into a run. This holding fire is memorialized forever in the wonderful Johnny Horton, Horton song. Uh, we held our fire till we seen their faces well. Uh, old Hickory said we could take him by surprise if we didn't fire our muskets till we looked him in the eyes. So we held our fire till we seen their faces well, and we opened up our squirrel guns and really gave them. Well, we fired our guns and the British kept it coming. Well, they kept it coming. Sheets of flame burst from the breast rope breastworks in their front as the wild riflemen of the backwoods rose and fired line upon line. Under the sweeping hail, the head of the British advance was shattered. The whole column stopped. Then it surged forward again, almost to the foot of the breastworks, but not a man lived to reach them. And in a moment more, the troops broke and ran back. Okay, I don't even know what happened there. I, that microphone's just a little bit odd. Roosevelt wants to drive home that American forces in the past have stood up against the greatest forces in the world and are second to none in action. That is something that, that he wants to be in the heart and soul of every young American reading this book. He also, again, wants to point out the uh, virtues of the, the ordinary backward soldier the American who has uh, 
toughened himself on the frontier, had the skills of the marksman, and the courage of a man who will stand and defend his country. So those are basic. Uh, and we see them reiterated in the hero tales. But another bit that's in this particular hero tale that's not clearly spelled out is Jackson himself is not really one of Theodore Roosevelt's role models uh, in a lot of ways. This is a time when he's, he's focusing on the virtues of a commander who on the battlefield there at New Orleans effectively saved the nation. Now the War of 1812 was over according to the treaty, but for the British to seize New Orleans, and by the way, the British commander didn't know about the treaty, Andrew Jackson didn't know about the treaty, news traveled slowly. But if that battle had ended with Pakenham and his troops in control of New Orleans at the base of the Mississippi River, the British weren't going to have that back. And that was going to cut the continent effectively in half. So it's not too strong to say that Andrew Jackson and his forces saved the nation that day. And that is something for which Theodore Roosevelt, a political opponent in just about every way, of Jackson's politics, nevertheless is acknowledging and praising in his American hero tales. Okay, thank you all for joining me today. I'm sorry for the period when the microphone went out. I hope it wasn't a very long period. Um, do I have any questions uh, before the day, before we wind up our session?